But we already have in the Word of God, I believe in the book of Isaiah, that the earth is round. So I think when we look at the Word of God, it doesn't contradict science at all. But rather, we come in oppositions of science falsely so called. So how does science prove the resurrection? Does it prove the resurrection at all? And the fact of the matter is, scientists have proven that the resurrection is true. And I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's even people who are atheists and agnostic will say that if you look at just the science, the resurrection really happened and Jesus really died. And the resurrection during the time of Christ and his crucifixion happened exactly how the Bible is because science proves that is the case. Back there on the table, we have notes for today. And there's also three pages on the far right-hand side, or farther right-hand side. And what that is, is that's an article taken from the Los Angeles Times in 1986, um, doing a review over the Journal of, I'm going to get it backwards, Journal of American Medical, Medical Association. Because what happened was around 1985, 1986, the Journal of American Medical Association released an article going through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and proving it scientifically. And what they said was this, and I'll go ahead and read it. Jesus Christ's death on the cross was a study in the agony of a man whose arms and legs, uh, their major nerves possibly cut by spikes, shot searing jolts of pain through body already ravaged by his blood loss from a severe whipping. Having suffered for at least three hours, Jesus finally died of an unusual, severe variety of blood loss, induced shock, and a type of suffocation that normally result from crucifixion. In the end, he may have suffered a climatic heart seizure, perhaps brought on by a blood clot breaking loose inside his arteries, and fatally damaging his heart muscle. More likely, perhaps, he suffered a final episode, episode of acute heart failure, possibly caused by a catastrophic disturbance in the rhythm of his heartbeat. If he did sustain a lance wound after he lost consciousness from, consciousness from the la for the last time, the spear tip probably pierced the chest cavity, releasing a combination of blood and fluid that accumulated because of the worsening asphyxiation or his result of uh, suffering, uh, suffocation. Asphyxiation is brought on by a suffocation. And when we look at the word of God, what does the Bible state about um, when Jesus Christ was pierced by the sword, what came out? The water would have resulted from a sack that a court, uh, circled the heart as a result of him suffering. Uh, the eye the, uh, suffering from suffocation. See that kind of The end of the lance probably penetrated Jesus' heart, too, but its effect was academic for the man while he perceived as the Son of God was already dead before the Roman soldier raised his weapon. These conclusions, at least, are the findings of the most complete medical review of the agony of Christ's death ever published in a medical journal. So when we look at this, these results are taken from Joe Schmo writing on this. Is not taken from the person who is studying medicine, but it's taken from a peer reviewed article where one doctor or several doctors, I believe in this case, sat down and wrote this journal. And so the other people, his colleagues or contemporaries, people on the same level of education that maybe have the same experience as him, they would have gone through the article and said, Yes, this is right, or No, it would not. So he's not just writing for just anybody, it's not just some common writing, but these are people who are professionals in their field. And that's what this um, Los Angeles Times newspaper is going over, is a journal that was professionally done and written concerning the death of Jesus Christ and his crucifixion. These conclusions, at least, are the findings of the most complete medical review of the agony of Christ's death ever published in a medical journal. The article containing the conclusions was published last week in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Last week, if you look at the top of your article there, it was published on March 28, 1986. So the peer-reviewed article or medical journal article, whatever you want to call it, was released 
in 1986. Surprisingly, perhaps, the new evaluation is apparently the first prominent medical evaluation of the crucifixion published in this century. No major, no major medical publication has addressed the issue at all in recent years. Dr. George Lundberg, the journal's editor and a pathologist himself, said he found nothing surprising in the post-mortem review of Jesus' death, adding that I believe the descriptions are realistic make good sense are, and are consistent with the expect, expectations would be for a crucifixion death. So when we look at this statement that he made, did he say that from the person who believes in the Bible it lines up perfectly? No, he said from the person who would die a crucifixion, doesn't matter if it was recorded in the Bible or it was recorded somewhere else, these things all line up medically. This would be something that would be consistent. This wouldn't be anything out of the ordinary. Leading pathologists across the country agree that the evaluation is interesting speculation, but not a final judgment. Indeed, questions so deeply rooted in history, philosophy, and theology cannot be resolved with certainty. So they're throwing out that they might have not been the case. But in fact, remark Dr. Michael Baden, Deputy Chief Medical Examiner. So once again, you have somebody who's up there in this field. In New York City, not only is it impossible to draw a truly reliable medical conclusion about Christ's death, but trying, trying too hard to do so may hopelessly confuse faith and science, but we know when the true science lines up with the word of God in our faith, it's not contradictory at all, but rather it proves the opposite, that they go hand in hand. When we look at, Baden has been involved, this, they're listing, listing his credentials, in such prominent cases as the assassination of JFK and the drug death of, John, of comedian John Belushi. Jesus' death, no debating, was not a representation, repre representative crucifixion, but the best known of all time. So it's not like we have scarce evidence or scarce comments concerning Christ's death, but it was recorded and in detail for the most part. Let me just go down just a little bit. I'm not going to bore you with the whole article. Okay, page three. The night before his death, Jesus said to have some scriptural accounts to have been in great emotional agony and that his sweat had the appearance of blood. This may sound out of the ordinary for some people, but they go on to say that there is such a state that a person can get in from great stress, turmoil, that the blood vessels actually break, and that blood is transferred to the sweat glands, and then, of course, it comes through the, bread, um, the skin through perspiration. It is known as per, uh, hemotrid hemotridrosis, if I pronounce that correctly. So when we get, even at the very beginning, when Jesus starts suffering for us, even in the garden, garden begging the Father to take the cup from him, the Bible says that he sweated great drops of blood. Well, how is that possible? Has anyone done this? Well, right here in the medical journal, it says it is possible. There is a condition that you can get into under great stress and agony that it actually causes your blood vessels to break. So when we look at that, we find that he was all... The Bible is already lining up with science, that the two are going hand in hand. It says, before his religious trial and blasphemy charges and the ordeal of crucifixion, Jesus almost certainly was in robust, robust physical condition, owing to the fact of, that his ministry required him to travel great distances on foot through what is now Israel. But by the morning of the crucifixion itself, he probably would have been in a state of great exhaustion and severe emotional upset, factors that would counteract his phys overall physical strength. Once Christ had been tried and condemned, the first step of the execution process was a severe scourging, inflicted with a type of whip that may have had pieces of sharp bone and metal tied into its thongs or onto the strings. The whipping was apparently severe, resulting in a large volume of blood loss that may have been as much as a quarter to a third of the body's total blood supply. So when we look at the whipping itself, we know the Bible goes into great detail 
on the earth, whipping itself. We know that the flesh hung off his, that his skin hung off his body as in ribbons. There is one point in the scriptures that actually records that the meat was taken away so much so that you can actually see his kidneys as well. You know, Christ endures such a great scourging, and right here, it confirms how great because he could have lost, they said, up to anywhere from a quarter to one third of blood loss. So it wasn't just a light ordeal, but Christ went through great um, pains for us, and even medic, uh, science is backing that up. And because of that, all these things are leading into his exhaustion because we know that he fell several times under the weight of the cross. Once Christ had been tried and condemned, the first step in the execution process was a severe scourging. We've heard that already. The blood loss set the stage for the early, early onset of shock. The fact that Christ could not support his weight of his own cross when instructed to carry it to the execution site lends additional support to the deepening shock theory. The fact that Christ's body was in such agony and shock from all the blood loss and everything else as to the fact that he could not have carried the cross that distance. And shock will also go into a role, play a role in his death as well. Jesus was attached to the cross with spikes five to seven inches long that were driven one each through the wrist and one through both of his feet. We know the Bible states that it was driven through his hands. This isn't contradictory, but have you ever tried to crucify somebody by striking um, nails through the palms of the hands? I hope the answer is new, no because we're recording this. But the truth of the matter is if you take your own hand and feel it, you can feel that if you put a nail in there, what's going to happen? It's just going to slide right off and rip the skin because there's nothing to attach to. But if you nail the individual through the wrist, right between those two bones, it locks them into place. Also, when you look into that area, the medical journal will go on and say that there's a bunch of nerves in there. Well, when you pound the, rip, the nail through the wrist, you're not just locking them into place, but you're destroying all those nerve endings. And when you do that, that would have caused great severe pain. It would have sent up rapid fires, uh, fiery pain going throughout his nervous system, and that would have added to the suffering of Jesus Christ. They said that there are no major arteries in the wrist, so there would have been no major... Um, risk of him dying, it just would have added to the agony. And their results were it would have sent excruciating, excruciating fire, fiery bolts of pain in both arms. Similar pain would have uh, occurred because both because of the wounds on the feet as well. Also, I'm going off my notes. It's been a proven fact that even if you wanted to hang somebody up and not strike nails to the wrist, but just um, we know that some of the crosses, uh, these were uh, tied to the cross. If you tie somebody to the monkey bars long enough and they can't pull themselves up eventually, they're going to die on the monkey bars. That's just the matter of the facts. And when we look at Christ and the way he was suspended, they had them all locked into place. Great agony of pain. We have here, we have shock already setting in we have the nerves being severed he was in a tremendous amount of pain and even science backs this up jesus would have suspended with much of his weight borne on his arms with his legs bent under him and the classic symptoms of crucifixion position would have been almost immediately started to reduce his respiratory capacity initiating a gradual lessening of the oxygen being mixed into his bloodstream and setting the stage for eventual um, suffocating, suffocation or asphyxiation, which we've all heard time and time again. How did you take a breath on the cross? Well, you had to push yourself up. They even go on to say that the, Jesus actually would have been breathing from his abdomen and not the chest capacity because of the way that they would have had him pump. And I'm just trying to shoot through this. Eventually, a combination of blood loss from the crucifixion and the toll of the ordeal itself would have brought on some onset called what they call hypovolemic shock, a state similar to which occurs in severe bleeding victims who are about to die. Meanwhile, the stress on Jesus' respiratory system would have 
precipitated symptoms like those of congestive heart failure and blood clots would have begun to form on the major arteries or valves of the heart itself. Eventually, in the last moments of Christ's agony, one of the clots may have broken loose, precipitating a catastrophic heart seizure that would have that would account for biblical descriptions of an apparently climatic final moment of agony. And he goes on to state that more than likely there was no such climatic heart attack itself. However, the death was due to more prob probably due to shock than anything else. The eventual overwhelming effect of exhaustion, induced suffocation, and some other sudden acute heart failure ep episode. That terminal moment would have been influenced by the onset of a fatal cardiac arrhythmia. It is not clear from available evidence. Itchy's death may have been influenced by actual cardiac rupture or heart rupture, a situation popularized in the traditional layman's perception of the crucifixion in which Christ is said to have died of a broken heart. In all, including the Mayo Clinic, the way of historical medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound to his side was inflicted. So when we look at even this review, we find that science lightens up the body. There is nothing in here that states that the way that Jesus died on the cross as recorded in the scriptures is contradictory to science. But rather, if you read the entire article, they'll say that is contrary altogether. Science and the Bible line up with the crucifixion of hell. Jesus really died the way that he said he did, and that he really died on the cross, and he was dead before the soldier pierced his side. When we look at his heart and the blood sack around him, where with came out blood and water, science backs that up. The way that he died in crucifixion is no different than any other way that anyone else crucified died in history. All everything lines up and science backs this. I don't have it in my notes, but there's even a well-known atheist um, way back in the day, I believe he was, but even he stated that whether that there is no doubt that Jesus Christ of Nazareth really died on that cross. So science backs it up. Atheists don't even deny the fact that Jesus Christ died on that cross because when you look at the account itself, everything points to that. He was dead, Brother Elon. If we look at the Roman time frame, they were known for executioners. When a person went to die on them through crucifixion, they were given a soldier that stayed with them the whole time. And we know through our study of the Word of God and history that that soldier was responsible for that criminal. If that criminal got away, that soldier would have been in that criminal's position, whatever his punishment was. We look at the book of Acts chapter 16. That's why the Roman centurion, the guard was going to kill himself. Because if everyone from that dungeon escaped, the Romans were going to inflict on him their punishment. So science backs up that Jesus Christ really died on that tree. If we wanted to get into several different theories and talk about those, we would find that the Bible lines up perfectly, and they have all kinds of weird theories out there. We, and I'm sure we've all heard about them. We're all we've been in church long enough, but we've all heard of the wrong tomb theory, where on the resurrection morning, the women went to the wrong tomb. And Jesus was in an entirely different tomb. But we know this isn't likely because, first of all, there were Roman guards that were sent to guard Jesus Christ. There was a seal marked on the tomb. And on top of that, we know that the women knew where the soldiers took them. Because even in the account of Mary Magdalene, she knew she was at the right tomb. Because when Jesus came and she thought he was a gardener, what did she say? I don't know where they took him. The disciples did not go to the wrong tomb. If they went to the wrong tomb, then guess what? Those angels were sitting at the wrong tomb. So the wrong tomb theory is completely absurd. You have the swoon theory. 
that states that well, Jesus Christ never really died on the cross. Even science proves that theory wrong and pushes it completely way, way, way out of the ballpark because it doesn't matter where you look in the scientific realm, whether they be Christian or whether they be agnostic, brother, you like, they all agree Jesus Christ died on the cross. There is no denying that. Science proves that. The fact that um, when they pierced the side, a flood of water came out. Jesus Christ was really dead on that cross, and there is no denying it. He did not swoon and just pass out. The Roman soldiers, another evidence we've already said that. Because if Jesus would have just passed out on the cross and the Roman officials got wind of it, then that soldier would have been responsible, and he would have been crucified in the place of Jesus Christ. We know that the swoon theory also is not false because if it was false, then the Roman uh, government, they would have sent out a wild goose chase hunt for Jesus Christ when they found out that he rose from the dead again. But nothing is said of it. We know that Jesus really died on the cross because if it wasn't for the, peer, peer, uh, the spear piercing his side, he was truly dead. And if he would not have been dead, his legs would have been broken just like the other two individuals. Because the Romans knew when somebody was dead or not. Plus the other thing too is they had to push up to breathe. And more than likely, Jesus was probably in a low-laying position where there's no way he could have caught his breath, and they knew it. Because everybody was looking on. It wasn't just Mary, the mother of Jesus, and John, the beloved, at the foot looking on. Everybody else was looking on as well. I mean, this was a crucifixion like none other in history. Yes, people have died in the past, but you ask any one of those Roman soldiers how many times the sky turned black during a crucifixion, or how many times there was a giant earthquake during a crucifixion. I'm sure everyone was looking on. Then you have the stolen body theory where the disciples stole the body of Jesus Christ. Well, reading the word of God, we know that in itself is completely false. Because when Peter first went to the tomb, what was his um, emotional state? It wasn't happiness, but rather it was more of a shock and awe. He had to run to the tomb to see if it was true. Mary Magdalene, she was in a state of discontent. She was in uh, grief. So she couldn't have been involved or even known of it if the disciples would have stolen the body. If somebody would have stolen the body, then why were the women bringing the spices to come and prepare the body for burial? When we look at, it doesn't matter what theory they throw out. When we look at true science, true, true science, not science as, Tim as Timothy wrote, as Paul wrote in Timothy, science falsely so called, but true science, it lines up with the Bible. It lines up with the crucifixion. And all true science points to the fact that Jesus Christ really died on that cross. And there is no denying it. And it's not just coming from a lower level, but science all the way from the, all the way, I should say all the way at the top, but people that have been revered and respected in their own field point to the fact that Jesus Christ really died on the cross. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not, science points that he died on the cross. Atheists agree that Jesus Christ of Nazareth really died on the cross. Doesn't matter how we look at it what people may say. It doesn't matter what false signs they might try to throw out. When we look at it as a whole, Jesus Christ really was what he said. It doesn't matter how we try to prove it. Because the Bible is accurate. It is 100% true. And we can test it through history. We can test it with science, true science, and find that every single time the Bible is correct. 
Anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add to the <coughs> I'm sure there's many other ways we could look at it. God's word is God's word. And at the end of the day, we can rest assured that when it comes down to it, Jesus Christ truly is the Son of God. But you know, if you really look at the fact, a lot of them doctors, you know, they should have known that there's no way after what Jesus went through, they should have actually made it so they could be God. No, and people will leave. Because, because a natural, you take a natural man, if he went through what he went and lost all that blood, he would pass out way before he even got there. And that's where Simon Serene came in to help carry the cross. Because that beam itself was, I think they say, 150 pounds. But even then, you know, Jesus, Jesus, to that, had he died before he got there, he could have all the illusion of the blood. If you took a normal person, they, they would have made it, they would have been dead before they even got there. Well, you see what I mean? I know what you're saying, brother. But for the sake of time, next week we'll go back to our study that we were going on with, what does it mean to become a Pentecostal powerhouse? But right now, let's go ahead and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, and no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds would be in good soil, and uh, that it would be good soil, Lord, for your work to follow on, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that we may apply it to our lives, that we may be even farther transformed into your very image. I pray, Lord, that you anoint the song leader and the musicians. Give them a special blessing as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords. Anoint the pastor's mind and his lips as it brings forth your word. May our hearts be good soil, that we may remember your word throughout the week, that we would take it to heart and actually apply it to our lives, Lord, that we would be farther transformed into your very image. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus.